hi, and welcome to The Working Songwriter, the show where today's best songwriters come to talk shop. I'm your host, Joe Pug. Each episode here, we host a distinguished guest, and we ask them to go deep on their inspiration, on their process, on the general ups and downs of making a life in music. So, whether you're a grizzled veteran, trying to sell your custom Steve Vai Ibanez with the handle cut out, or else a scrappy upstart, trying to sell your vintage Roland 808, this is your show, because ultimately, it is what every writer seeks most, an ironclad excuse to put off actually writing. Hey everybody, it's the third Friday of September 2020, and I thank you for joining us. This week's show is brought to you by Bandzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Bandzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. I'm old enough to remember when you had to pay somebody called a web developer to get a website made, and it would always be some guy named Diego who drove a Mini Cooper with a checkered roof who was always trying to convince you that there was going to be a second wave ska revival that never materialized. And old Diego would charge you about a thousand bucks for a website that was obsolete in like six months. But it's the future now, you guys. That's not how it works anymore. Uh, We're allowed to have nice things now. One of those nice things is Banzoogle. Banzoogle powers the websites of tens of thousands of musicians around the world, from weekend warriors to Grammy winners. All the features you need for a professional website are already built in. Hosting and a custom domain name, dozens of fully customizable design templates, tools to sell your merch, commission-free. Uh, listeners to the Working Songwriter podcast, listeners can go to bandzoogle.com, try it for free for 30 days, use the promo code TWS, the initials of our show, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Uh, if you'd like to hear some of my music live in the coming months, Every Sunday night, I'm over on my YouTube channel for Sunday Songs at 9 p.m. Eastern. It is a live stream. I will be live. That means I'll be playing some of my tunes, taking questions and requests from people in the live chat. It's it's really become a a fun, interactive experience. I think we're building something of a little community over there, including many listeners to this podcast uh, who are over there on Sunday night. So come on over and be a part of it Sunday night. 9 p.m. Eastern over on my YouTube channel. Finally, if you enjoy this podcast, if you'd like to help it remain a viable endeavor for me, here's a couple things that you could do to help. You could become a supporter of the show over at Patreon. Patreon is a platform that allows you to directly support creative endeavors that you find meaningful. You just head to their site, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. You search for Joe Pug or you search for The Working Songwriter. And then you sign up to kick in a few bucks every month as a voluntary subscription. A subscription that you don't have to pay, but that you choose to pay because you dig the show. Uh, If just 1% of our listenership kicked in the price of a cup of coffee every month, it would make a huge difference. Uh, And if you're not in a place to contribute financially, I totally get that. I've been there before myself. Uh, There's a couple things that you could do to help for free. First, you could leave us a rating in the iTunes store. That's free. Or you could also simply tell a friend about the show. That's totally free. And the simple math on those two things is that they will help me much more than they will be a pain in the ass for you. I'll end all the harassment there. This was a very fun episode to tape, and I hope you enjoy our conversation. My guest this week moved to New York City to study film and ended up a musician. Joan Osborne enrolled at New York University to study under legendary documentarian George Stoney, but ended up singing in various nightclubs in Manhattan, and then Destiny took its course. She signed to Mercury Records and in 1995 released her debut album, Relish, which featured the multi-platinum hit, One of Us. For any of our listeners who are too young to have remembered it, that song was a ubiquitous smash, played everywhere in the country and around the world for about two years straight, anywhere you went. 
Since then, she's continued releasing critically acclaimed albums on the national stage for the last few decades. She's headlined the Lilith Fair. She's toured with the Dixie Chicks, The Dead, Phil Lesh, and many others. She was featured in the 2002 documentary film Standing in the Shadows of Motown and toured with Motown sidemen, the Funk Brothers. She's been nominated for eight Grammy Awards. She's appeared on The Tonight Show, The Late Show with David Letterman, and Saturday Night Live. She's recorded for Mercury, Interscope, Polygram, and Universal Music. The New York Times has said she sings with forthrightness and finesse. American Songwriter once said of her debut that it was that rare breed of album where critical consensus, popular approval, and enduring appeal unite. A few weeks ago, Joan was kind enough to jump on the phone with me and tell me about her journey so far. Joan Osborne, thanks so much for being a part of The Working Songwriter. You grew up in Kentucky, made an early move to New York City in the 1980s. That must have been quite a culture shock for you. Can you describe <laughs> your impressions of the city when you first arrived? Yeah, I actually first came to New York City via the Port Authority. Uh, I was on a bus. And uh, it's uh, it, if you are familiar with New York City, you know that the Port Authority is is kind of a uh, this teeming mass of humanity uh, right next to the whole Times Square area. Uh, so coming into New York City in that way was uh, it was kind of shocking. I mean, I'm, of course, I knew what to expect that it was a big city, but the details of it, uh, you know, I, I didn't really. Uh, they were all very new to me. Um, but you know, I, I loved New York city from the moment I came here and I loved that you could walk down the street and see every kind of person, every nationality, every fashion sensibility, every sexual orientation, every, everything, um, all out in the street and, uh, just the, the mass of people, uh, you know, i I found it really liberating. I think coming from a town that was pretty small and everybody kind of knew everybody uh, and to, to be sort of dropped into the midst of New York and this vast, you know, canvas of people was amazing. And, and I still love that about New York. So it sounds more of a feeling of exhilaration rather than uh, uh, intimidation. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there was a fair share of both. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I, I was up for it, but uh, you know, it was not always easy. You know, of course I was, I was a student. I didn't have any money. I, you know, was living in a crappy apartment. I, you know, woke up one morning with a cockroach perched on my upper lip. You know, it was, yeah. it was a pretty, uh, you know, it, it was pretty down to the bone, uh, you know, as many students are, you know, and, uh, you know, I didn't have money for a, a raincoat or, uh, you know, I didn't have good shoes and I had to walk everywhere. So it was it was rough. But that energy of being in the city uh, really kept me going and, and kept me excited. That sounds like the legit uh, uh, baptism by fire of moving to New York City <laughs> to me. Now, you moved there yeah. to to study film. Um, what discipline of film were you studying and, and what drew you to that? Uh, yeah, I was at New York University studying filmmaking. And, uh, you know, at first, I just wanted to learn everything that I could. And I didn't know what particular discipline I might go into. But I started pretty quickly to gravitate toward documentary films. And that really sort of became my focus. And I thought that's what I was going to do with, you know, for my career and with my life was, uh, get involved in documentary films and make documentaries. Um, and I think the thing that really uh, kind of galvanized me about that is just the, you know, the characters that you would meet in documentary films were so interesting and so unique and so much more, uh, you know, individual than anything that you would see in a fiction film um, that I just was so turned on by that. And I had some great teachers, too. I studied with George Stoney, who's sort of a legend in documentary film. And uh, it really that really captivated me. You know, kids growing up now who have uh, Netflix, everyone is so used to having 
uh, documentaries at their fingertips. There's almost a glut of documentaries. But I mean, mm. I can imagine in the 1980s, that was still a very kind of nascent art form. It must have been a small community of people that were making those professionally. Well, I think it was a, a smaller community than the fiction film community. And, you know, documentaries were sort of notorious for being uh, uh, the place where you go to, you know, for all your dreams of economic security to die. You know, <laughs> it wasn't exactly a place. You were not going to get rich making documentary films. Um, and even somebody like Ken Burns, you know, will say the same thing even now, even though there's all these different opportunities for people to see documentaries, which didn't exist back then. Um, so people tended to do it for the love of it and this sense of real, uh, like a sense of a calling um, to it. You know, well, speaking of that, then economic insecurity, you went uh, from the fine frying pan into the fire then to, to go into the music <laughs> business. Um, so yeah. <laughs> tell me, you got your sort of professional start. Um, it, it seems sort of like casually singing in some clubs in New York City for fun or or, or were you were you exploring that as a new avenue? How intentional was your your shift into music? Oh, it was not intentional at all. Uh, in the beginning, it was really just that I kind of stumbled upon this music scene that was happening uh, kind of all around me. Um, I had gone out for a drink with a guy who lived in my building, and the the bar that was on the corner happened to be a blues bar, and they this was late at night so the band had finished but the piano player was still there playing just for himself and for a handful of patrons that were still in the bar and my friend dared me to go up and sing a song with him and said that he would buy the drinks if I did that so you know being the broke student that I was I was like okay um and I went up and introduced myself to the piano player and and we you know talked for a second and figured out that there was a song that we knew and figured out that you know, there was a key that I could probably sing it in. And so I sang uh, the Billy Holiday song, God Bless the Child, um, you know, just really sort of impromptu like that. And the piano player uh, said, well, you know, that's pretty good. We have an open mic night here once a week. Why don't you come down and sing again? So I started going to this open mic night and I started meeting, you know, a lot of musicians and I started hearing about other clubs that had open mic nights. And uh, you know, I just kind of slowly, uh, you know, it sort of slowly dawned on me that there was all this music happening around me. You know, I hadn't really been that aware of it because I was so concentrated on studying and, and on film. Um, and I think there was something about just the act of singing that really opened up these places in me that I had been uh, kind of closed off to. You know, filmmaking is it's a wonderful art form, but it's an art form that is much more intellectual and it's much more about technology, whereas music and in, in particular singing is about your body and it's about uh, your your soul and it's this very physicality uh, you know of it and the very heightened emotional uh, you know part of it that I think I was that I had been sort of closed off to. and music really opened that part of me up. And it was very, uh, it was very exciting. It was, it was frightening to sort of be vulnerable in that way, especially if you're standing on a stage in front of a, you know, a nightclub full of people you don't know. Uh, it's, it can be frightening and, and intimidating, but it, it can also be very liberating. And I think that's what really turned me on to music. And, uh, you know, eventually I got so involved in the music scene and was spending all this time, you know, going out to clubs and seeing bands and uh, spending all my spare money on, you know, Etta James records and Howlin' Wolf records. And, uh, you know, I realized that I was kind of hooked and I thought to myself, well, if I don't follow this and see where it goes, I'm always going to regret it. And that's when I decided to try to do music seriously. That must have been sort of daunting, though. There's this idea of the sunk cost fallacy, which it's much harder to walk away from something once you have a lot invested in it. You had time uh, and your own money. You were putting yourself through school, um, invested mm -hmm. in film school. Uh, there had to be a part of you that said, no, just stay the course. Uh, was that the case or, or were you completely sure about making that switch to music? Oh, I wasn't sure about it at all. Um, and I definitely, you know, had some reservations about doing it. 
But uh, as I said, I, I, you know, I was still young and I felt like if I don't at least give this a try, I'm always going to wonder what would have happened. And uh, I'm, you know, I, I think that was probably true. I think if I had continued to, to follow this, you know, course of being in filmmaking, I would always have wondered, you know, what, what would have happened if I had stuck with the music and not that, you know, being a filmmaker, that probably would have been a very satisfying career and, and could have also been a great life. Um, but uh, there was something that was just more insistent to me about music. Mm. Now, before you got to your breakout record with Mercury Records and the album Relish, I noticed this was very interesting to me. There was a good amount of time between when you first started singing in clubs and, and when that breakthrough happened. And you even started mm -hmm. your own label in 1991, mm -hmm. Womanly Hips, which, again, people who are in the music business now, that's a normal thing for a singer-songwriter to, to start their own label. Back then, it was positively revolutionary in a way. How did you decide to start your own company like that? And, and how did it work on a technical level? How did you put it together? I mean, we, you know, I decided to start my own label because we, you know, I had started playing in clubs in New York City and got to a point where I was playing uh, with my own band like five nights a week in New York City. And I realized I needed to, uh, you know, kind of stretch out. And, and so, uh, on the advice of the, the guy who was managing me, managing me at that time, a guy named Paul Rosselli, I started looking for work in cities nearby and we would go up to Boston and we would go to Rochester and we would go to Burlington, Vermont, and we'd go to Washington, DC, we'd go to Philly, we'd go to Scranton, PA, we would go anywhere that was within a day's drive. And we started building a following that way. And wherever we went and wherever we played, people were always coming up to us after the shows and saying, I want to buy your music. Where can I buy it? And we didn't have anything to sell them. <laughs> we yeah. didn't have a record to sell them. So it was literally just because I needed uh, you know, to make a record because people were asking for one. And nobody was standing around you know, looking to offer me a record deal. So I thought, well, you know, I guess I need to figure out how to do this by myself. So I went to a bookstore and I found this book called How to Release Your Own, you know, Record and just, you know, sort of went through the steps. And, you know, you say that it was revolutionary, but, uh, you know, this comes after, you know, this was in the 1980s and there were plenty of, you know, punk labels and DIY labels that had been doing this kind of thing since the 70s. So there was information out there. And there was a, a bit of a blueprint and a map of how to do this for yourself uh, that was there for me to follow. So it wasn't like I just made it all up, you know, on my own. There were books and, and uh, you know, this was before the Internet, so there were no websites, but there were books that you could find that sort of laid out the steps for you. And that's what I did. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I, I guess it would be a lot of that punk DIY stuff. And also, uh, God rest his soul, John Prine kind of uh, did that a bunch in the mm. 80s with, with Oh Boy Records. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And, I mean, it's it's just born of necessity when if you you can't wait around for someone to come along and pick you, uh, you know, it, if what you really want to do is, is get your music out there. If no one's standing around waiting to give you a record deal or to make you famous or whatever, you just have to figure out how to do it for yourself. Indeed. And, and I can't think of a better reason for making a record than a bunch of people coming to a show and saying, I'd like to buy your record. I think that's a great reason yeah. to make a record. <laughs> yeah. We uh, knew we could sell at least some of them, you know. <laughs> right. Totally. Uh, well, so eventually after that, after really, you know, pounding the pavement all over the East Coast and, and regionally, someone did come to you and say, I, I want to sign you. I, I, it was Mercury Records. You go in to make mm -hmm. uh, your breakthrough album, Relish. Can you talk to me about how that whole process worked and, and the making of that album? Mm-hmm. Well, we uh, we were playing a show in Philadelphia, and a guy named Rob Hyman, who was a member of the band The Hooters, uh, was at the show. And he came backstage afterwards, and he was really enthusiastic about, you know, the music that he'd heard. And he said, "I have a, a friend who's just starting an imprint at Mercury Records, and I think you should go talk to him. This is exactly the kind of thing that he's looking for." So um, I went and spoke to the, you know, Rob's friend, who happened to be a guy named Rick Chertoff. And Rick Chertoff was a producer uh, who had had some success with Sophie Hawkins, Sophie B. Hawkins, and also with Cyndi Lauper. He had some huge, huge hits with Cyndi Lauper and had produ produced her first record. Um, 
So I went and met with him and he was just starting his own imprint at Mercury Records. And, you know, he was this really very chill guy, very smart, um, you know, soft spoken, but very thoughtful. And we sat in his office and we had this very long conversation and, you know, we kind of just got to know each other. And I, you know, I thought to myself, well, this is not some kind of, you know, uh, stereotypical record business dude who's all hyping and, and, you know, promising the moon and stuff like that. He's just trying to take time to get to know me and get to know what I'm about. And, uh, you know, I really appreciated that about him. And, you know, we ultimately came to an agreement that we would work together uh, because I was a fan of Cindy Lauper and I, I respected that he had produced her and I was a fan of the work that he'd done with Sophie B. Hawkins. So I thought, you know, why not? Um, so we ended up working together uh, with him and with Rob Hyman and also a guy named Eric Bazilian, an, another member of the Hooters. The four of us worked together uh, in the studio to write and record uh, the, the album that would become Relish. And, uh, you know, it was a very lengthy process and it was really you know this word gets used a lot but it was really organic you know we would sit around in the studio and people would have ideas and and that would you know somebody would have a uh, an idea for a chord progression and that would spark a melody idea and then I'd pull out my notebooks and and throw some lyrics and some uh, you know some singing at it and you know some of the ideas went nowhere and some of them became songs yeah oh uh, that's that's see when I was a kid I thought that's how every album would get made uh, not, like, surprisingly few. Well, you know, it's, it's any way you can do it is the right way to do it. You know? Yeah, definitely. But but that does sound like a really um, edifying process to be able to sit around with people that you respect and and dig and just make art with them for the sake of making art. Uh, at a certain point, it sounds like. Yeah. Well, I don't think anybody necessarily thought that you know, it was, we were going to make some giant hit record. I certainly didn't think that. I mean, I just, I just wanted to do something that I liked and that would be cool. And, you know, the, the people that I admired uh, were people like Tom Waits, you know, who had an amazing career, did his own music in the way that he wanted to never had a giant hit, but was always had an audience that was there uh, ready to go along with whatever he was interested in doing. Um, and uh, to me, that was sort of, you know, the the ideal was to have a career like that. And it was kind of a surprise to me that, uh, you know, Relish ended up being, you know, the hit that it was and, and getting that kind of attention that it got and selling as many records as it, it did. I'm, you know, it's a good surprise. It's a happy thing. But it was not something that I went into this whole process thinking, well, yeah, I want to have a big hit. At what point, obviously the song that took off uh, from Relish was one of us. When that started mm -hmm. taking off, was there a particular moment when you realized that your life was professionally, at least was going to be different afterwards? Um, you know, I, I'm not really sure if there was a single moment. Um, you know, we were on the road, myself and my road band, um, you know, from the time that Relish was released, we went out and toured and toured and toured and toured. And it wasn't until many months into uh, us being on this sort of endless tour that the, the song One of Us started to get attention. And we started to, you know, we were visiting radio stations everywhere we went. And, um, you know, we started to hear back from, uh, you know, from people in the shows and from the people at the radio stations. Oh, yeah, this song's getting a lot of traction. People really like it. They, they're they requesting it. And it's, you know, it's climbing up our charts and whatever. And, and you know, we were happy about that. Um, but we were sort of in the day to day reality of you get up in the morning, you get into the van, you drive to the next town, you unload the gear, you do your sound check, you go eat dinner somewhere, you do your show, you try to find the hotel, you wake up and, you know, you go, you crash and that's just your day-to-day -day reality. So, um, it, it wasn't, it, it never really dawned on me. I don't think of like, here's this moment of like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be famous. You know, it, it all sort of, uh, it, it just kind of, the venues got bigger and the crowds got bigger and the responsibilities to publicize things became more, you know, I had more interviews as the record became more pop popular, as the song One of Us became more popular, there was more work to do to support that. 
Um, but, you know, really it was kind of just an extension of what we had been doing before. It it sounds just like a very good and positive version of the frog being boiled in water and, and not knowing that they're being boiled, you know, just like the best possible version of that. Um, so you, you were touring a ton then, and your life must have looked very different for the next, you know, uh, let's say four, five, six years after that album came out. You must have been doing a ton. Um, how did you handle that? What was that? Uh, was it uniformly good? Was it a mix? Like, it, that seems like fun and exciting, but it, I can see there mm -hmm. being some stressful parts of that and some overwhelming parts of that as well. Yeah, well, I mean, all, all that you say is, is very true. There there were definitely, uh, you know, parts of it that were incredibly exciting. And, you know, to be able to travel around the world and play music for people in front of bigger and bigger and bigger crowds and, you know, playing events like the Ruskield Festival and and playing, you know, for the Olympics in Atlanta and, uh, you know, going on TV and doing the David Letterman show and doing the Tonight Show. And, you know, all those things were really cool and really exciting. And I have to say that being on television, it, it was not a huge thing for me. But once my family saw me on television, you know, my parents who had not been particularly supportive of, you know, my choice to do music, suddenly they were all in. You know, they were sure. like, oh, I understand now. I get it now. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so that part of it was really exciting. Um, and, you know, there were certainly parts of it that were not super exciting. I mean, I'm kind of a private person. So suddenly I was very recognizable and people, you know, everywhere I went, people were like, oh my God, that's Joan Osborne and would be, you know, following me around and, and, uh, you know, people would pull their cars over onto the sidewalk if I was walking down the street and, you know, jump out and try to follow me. And, you know, it was, it was crazy stuff like that, none of which I really enjoyed. Um, so that was maybe not so great. Um, and also the, you know, the pressure of putting out a follow up to the Relish record. I think it really did a number on my head because I was not able to come up with a, um, a follow up for years and uh you know i had like the sophomore slump like the textbook example of the sophomore slump and that was a that was a tough thing um but i have to say it, it i think coming out of that it taught me a lot about um just you know you really have to get out of your own head and you really have to be in love with the process of making music and forget about any product and forget about you know what might happen with it and and will it be successful and will it not be successful? And, you know, there, you have to make a space for yourself where you forget about all that. And it's not an easy thing to do. And I wasn't able to do it for a long time, but it's, it's really necessary. It sounds like one of the ways that you were able to do it. Um, I, I actually, I played a festival with you years ago, like 10 years ago, I saw you playing with Trigger Hippie. And it was the first mm. time as a young person playing music, because I'd known your music and loved it when I was a kid in the 90s. And it was my first time seeing an artist that I really dug. And I was like, oh, there, if you work really hard and you're smart about it, there can be whole different lifetimes within your, your musical journey. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. um, so it seems like that second part of your musical journey really began. You sort of forged a relationship with, lack of a better word, kind of the jam community. You played with Phil Lesh a bunch, mm -hmm. with Jackie Green and everybody in Trigger Hippie. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like that scene uh, helped you uh, get over what you kind of dubbed? Well, you dubbed it a sophomore slump, but it's more the idea of disconnecting the expectations of music with, with the process mm -hmm. of creating it. Well, it you know, it's certainly, uh, you know, I think the first uh, kind of foray that I had into the jam scene was actually before I had a record deal. And when I was still playing in New York, I used to play this club called Wetlands. And that was a real center for the jam band scene. And people like Dave Matthews would play there and, and Warren Haynes. And, uh, you know, it was, it was uh, quite a, a, like a center of that whole community. So I was, I knew about that community and I had sort of a place in the New York city version of that community. And some of those fans, you know, where there was a loose network of those fans who would talk to each other. And so people from the jam community would show up at our shows in, you know, Burlington, Vermont, say, or Buffalo, New York. Um, but it wasn't until I worked with the dead 
um, that I think it, that really, that association really kind of took off, you know, when, when they uh, decided that they were going to go out and do a tour together, the four remaining members after Jerry Garcia passed away, um, you know, they knew that they were going to need some additional musicians to fill out the lineup. And uh, it just so happened that the booking agent that I was working with at the time was also working with them. And he suggested me. And so they flew me out to San Francisco and I uh, met with, uh, Bobby and Phil and all the guys, and we did a show together at the Warfield in San Francisco, and it just kind of felt natural, you know. I, the, their music, the, the Dead's music, comes from this this place of, uh, you know, taking all these different strands of American music, like the blues and bluegrass and folk music and Appalachian music, and sort of weaving it together. And that was one of the things that we were trying to do on Relish is take these different strands of, of this American roots music and weave it together to create something new. So I think we had this shared vocabulary, the, the guys in the band and myself, and were able to, you know, come up musically with, with things uh, where I was able to sort of follow what they were doing and I was able to find my parts within their songs and uh, it just seemed to to work. So um, so they so I got the gig and uh, went on the road with them and did a whole big summer tour with them. And and that was, I think, what really exposed me to the jam band scene. And how did that tour and that experience um, how did it change your creative direction? Did it change your creative direction or did it um, did it just embolden you to follow a direction that you were already on? Well, you know, I think that's a good, that's a good question. Right after I did that tour with them, um, I ended up doing a record down in Nashville. And, you know, it was, I think it was partly from my association with them. It was partly from, from uh, you know, the fact that Willie Nelson was the co-headliner on a lot of those dates. Uh, and so I was hearing Willie's music every night. And just before I had gone on tour with the Dead, I did a, a tour opening for the Dixie Chicks, and their music was in my head every night. So it just seemed to me to be the right moment to, to do something that had a country flavor to it. So I went and wrote a bunch of songs and, and also, you know, sourced a bunch of songs myself and, and the producer, Steve Buckingham sourced a bunch of country songs and I wrote some things and uh, went into the studio in Nashville right afterwards. So uh, I, I think if it, it just kind of maybe, uh, you know, created this sort of musical, um, you know, background in, in my life for the months before it that made it easier to write those kind of songs and, and to uh, to function in that sort of country vein. It, it's pretty hard to do a long tour with other acts and then try to write afterwards and not have a good deal of their music creep up through what you're writing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I think that's part of what we do as musicians. We listen to other people's work and, you know, you're influenced by it. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily copying them, but, uh, you know, I, I think that that's a very, uh, I think that's a great way to learn how to become a better musician and a better songwriter is to, you know, look for people that inspire you and listen to that and steep yourself in that. And then even if you're literally trying to copy someone else's style, it's not ever going to sound exactly like that because you are yourself and you are a unique person you know, musician, you're a unique singer. So it's going to come out sounding different, even if you're trying to copy them. And if you're not trying to copy and you're just, you know, taking some ideas and, and borrowing some stylistic uh, points from them, then I think that's a great way to learn about, uh, you know, what you're doing and how to, and to become a better writer and performer. Professional songwriters with a budget behind them have their songs radio tested in different markets to discover how their sound compares to the sound of the songs at the top of the Billboard charts. But as an indie songwriter, what do you have? You play an iPhone recording of your latest demo to your Uncle Larry after he's drank like six Mickey's hand grenades and he tells you that it sounds like his favorite Aerosmith song from 1978? Where can you get some better feedback? Core Sound. Core Sound is a professional AI-based music analysis tool available now as an iOS app. 
Core Sound determines the relevance of your music to the tops of Apple Music using the most advanced neural network algorithms. You simply download the app, upload your song, select a genre and market for comparison, and Core Sound does the rest. It lets you know how much your sound has in common with the sound of today's most popular songs. Core Sound is now available in Apple's App Store. So, let Uncle Larry mercifully pass out in the Barca lounger on his back porch and leave the feedback on your songs to Core Sound. You heard Joan talk about the pressure of writing a follow-up to her debut album and how difficult it was to bear. She said she fell into the familiar doldrums of a sophomore slump, which, it should be noted, only occurs when expectations have been set so high that they're nearly impossible to attain. Facing the empty page is daunting on its own, but add in the pressure of expectations from fans around the world, an often fickle music press, and a bottom-line focused record label, and I'd imagine that it becomes insurmountable. I truly believe that facing an empty page is facing a kind of abyss. It's the abyss of the present moment truly and fully noticed and considered. And that's terrifying. I wonder if writing her follow-up to her debut, Joan felt something like what's described in this poem by Jim Harrison, entitled, The Present. The cost of flight is landing. On this warm winter day in the southwest, down here on the edge of the border, I want to go to France, where we all came from, where the Occident was born near the ancient caves near Lascaux. At home, I'm only sitting on the lip of this black hole, a well that descends to the center of the earth with a big telescope aimed straight down. I see a red dot of fire and hear the beast howling. My back is suppurating with disease. The heart lurches left and right. The brain sings its ditties. Everywhere blank white movies wait to be seen. The skylark dove within inches of the rocks before it stopped and rose again. God's toes are buried deep in the earth. He's ready to run. But where? I want to talk to you about uh, creativity a bit, and and specifically through the the lens of your new record. Um, When you're creating this new record, Trouble and Strife, looking back Mm -hmm. on it now, how do you think your creative process has changed since you first began? Well, I don't know if I can speak to the entire creative process, but just for this particular record, um, it was a different, uh, it was a different kind of thing. Um, I had given myself sort of a deadline and I had hired the band to come in and work on some songs with me in the studio. And I, you know, up until like the week before, I didn't really know what we were going to do. Um, and about four days beforehand, I said to myself, you know, we could work on some more Bob Dylan songs. I just released a, a album of Bob Dylan covers. We could work on some songs from another songwriter and, and, you know, we could do that or I could write some stuff myself. So I said, you know what, I'm just going to try and see what I can come up with. And I pulled out all of my songwriting notes and, and little, you know, iPhone uh, recordings that I had made over the last you know, handful of years and went through them. And in the space of three days, I wrote like 14 new songs. Um, wow. and I had never, I'd never in my life done anything like that. I had always, I've always been the kind of, you know, writer who just takes forever and, you know, procrastinates and, and, you know, worries ideas to death. And, you know, I, I had never, you know, done anything like that. 
But there was something so liberating about having this hard deadline, about having, you know, just like locking myself into this room and, you know, pulling, pulling out all these ideas that I had sort of, that I had sort of banked and saved up. Um, And, you know, for whatever reason, maybe because I'm at this point in my life where I care less about what other people think about me, so I don't have to worry about is anybody going to like this or not I really just had to worry about do I like this um, um, maybe it's because I've been doing this for a long time and I you know have have learned how to uh, you know to just do it without wor- without uh, you know getting in my own way or without stressing about it so much uh, you know certainly I'm, I'm a better guitar player than I was when I first started out I'm not a great guitar player but you know, as a songwriter, I can, you know, sit in a room with a guitar and come up with melody ideas and, and, uh, you know, chord structures and, and, uh, you know, parts and things like that. Um, so I don't know exactly why, but it, it all came together in a, in a pretty quick way. And, you know, probably seven or eight of the songs on the record were written in that one big three or four day rush of writing. Man, 14 songs in three days is quite mm-hmm. the bounty. Um, I love uh, what you were talking about there, all those iPhone demos and little scribbles mm-hmm. you put down. I call that the bone pile. I think it's so – the bone <laughs> pile is your friend, man. You, you're just thanking oh, yeah, past yeah. you uh, for getting up in the middle of the night and and, and warbling into your iPhone. Uh, you know. You've know, you got to get it in the moment that it, you know, that it comes to you. And that's – you know, I, I think as much as technology – is, uh, you know, mixed blessing. I'm glad that I've got my, you know, iPhone there and that whenever, you know, I've got an idea, I can, you know, grab my phone. And even if I'm out somewhere, I go run into the bathroom or something and, and, you know, sing this little idea into the iPhone. And then I've got it because otherwise, if I wait till I get home, if I wait till the proper moment, that idea is well gone and it's yeah. never coming back again. So you got to grab it when you can. No, you, you really have to because it everything can hinge on on phrasing, like a, a decent song can go to a beautiful song, just if if the phrase is perfect, and if it's not perfect, it's just a dime a dozen. Um, mm-hmm. And this way, you don't have to be one of those weird people uh, that carries around. Remember back in the day, let's say ten or fifteen years ago, where you just had to have one of those recorders with like the the mini analog tape in it. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> to, I used to have those a little the little cassette tape and yes. the little, and I would you know I'd have my notebook and my little cassette tape in my purse, and you know that stuff's great too. Um, but it's, you know, the iPhone is, is a little more convenient because it's, you know, you're always going to have it on you. Sadly. Sure, sure. Well, so it sounds like those three days, uh, creating this record, uh, were, were sort of anomalous for you to be that, um, to be that productive. Can you describe to our listeners what a typical day would look like for you creatively? If you're off the road, you didn't have any, let's say for that day, you know, parental responsibilities or something, you have a day dedicated to being creative. What does that day usually look like for you? Um, boy, those are rare days where I don't have parental responsibilities. <laughs> I know the feeling. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's less that it's an entire day and it's more like a three hour chunk of time. Sure. Um, and you know, frankly, you don't need an entire day if you do it on a regular basis. You know, if you, if you are expecting to do everything, you know, for, for a month in one entire day, then, you know, that's, that's not a good practice. You want to, you want to have, you know, chunks of time littered throughout the week and throughout the month. And, you know, what, as you say, what I normally will do is sit and go through the little bits and pieces that I've been collecting. And even if it's a bit bit and piece that I have listened to five or six times before and nothing came of it, I'll go back and listen to it again because, you know, I might, I might have the key to it in that moment or I might be able to combine it with this other lyric that I just wrote the other day that I didn't have before and it might, and that might work. So, you know, it's, you want to be able to, you know, have all these bits and pieces to, to work with. Um, sometimes I will start out reading some poetry, you know, reading some Walt Whitman or uh, reading books of, of lyrics from other songwriters uh, like Nick Cave or Lou Reed. And, and just to try to prime the pump in that way, it's not that you're going to steal their words, but that it sort of trains your brain to think in a poetic way. So that if you've got 
uh, you know, if you, you see something, uh, you know, out your window or someone you overhear a snippet of conversation that sounds interesting, you're able to take that little snippet. And if your if your brain is thinking in a poetic way, you can expand upon it. And maybe that becomes a lyric. Maybe that becomes a chorus. Maybe that becomes that one little lyric that you're missing from a song that you wrote three weeks ago, but haven't been able to finish. So you sit down and you just, you know, maybe you drink a bunch of coffee. Uh, you know, maybe you, you know, I try not to listen to too much other music. Like I will listen to other music to kind of get myself in that frame of mind, but I try not to get too into that because otherwise I'll just listen to records and not think of my own. Mm. So I have to, you know, I'll, I'll listen to a little bit of music, but I don't want to spend the entire, you know, three or four hours doing that. And, uh, you know, and then you just try to get into the zone, you know, you just try not to worry about all the stuff you got to do. And you try not to, you know, of course, things are going to come to you like, oh, I forgot to call so and so back, or oh, I have to go to the store and pick up this, you write it down, you set it aside, and then you go back to your, your creative work. Um, And just let your let your mind wander, you know, let it, let it uh, off the leash, you know, let it do what it's, meant to do you know your mind is really um it you think in you know i have this writing exercise that i do and i call it spider webbing where you take an idea or you take a phrase and you put it in the center of the page and then you draw a circle around it and then you just allow yourself to associate other things and you and you write those little associations down around uh this central idea and then you connect those different associations to each other. And that's the way your mind works. It's, it doesn't usually work in a linear fashion where you can sit down and, and you know, write a song or a poem from beginning to end. Normally, your mind works in, in the sense that it's, it's grabbing these little associations, uh, you know, from visual associations or word associations from other parts of your life and attaching them to that central idea. And that's where you get, you know, the real interesting stuff. And that's where you can sort of fall into that flow and stop thinking and just, you know, just, and that's a great place to be. That sounds like a wonderful place to be. And it it sounds, it's interesting, like what you just described, you said, on on the one hand, you're letting your, your mind kind of, uh, you know, roam, uh, like, like a dog let let off its leash. And, And on the other hand, though, you very consciously decided where you've allowed that dog to roam, like where you put it down. And and I think that that's so mm-hmm. critical, putting yourself in that place, either reading poetry, lyrics, doing an exercise like you just described. I think it really puts your mind in a place that it, it, it transports it. it it's kind of like, um, I don't want to talk too much here, but it's sort of like if you need to put a new roof on your house, you've never noticed your neighbor's roofs before, but now when you're driving around the neighborhood, all you notice is other people's roofs until you have a new <laughs> roof put on, then you never notice a roof uh-huh. ever again in your life. And... Um, yeah, when you're heading into a creative world, you want to be putting in information like that so that uh, your mind starts to notice those different connections in a way that maybe it wouldn't be aware of otherwise. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, it's a, the more that I do this, the more I realize that, uh, you know, we have this image of writing or being an artist as, you know, you're seized by this, you know, creative muse and, and it just comes through you and, you know, that's, that's all great. And that can happen. But most of it is just, it's a practice. And it's like, a, it's a, it's a craft, it's a practice, and it's a discipline. And you, you know, you just make sure that you practice it enough, with you know, enough times, enough times a week, enough times a month, whatever, that you can, you know, get into that mindset and, and have enough material that you will then look through it and, you know, most of the stuff you write, maybe you never want anyone to see and you may never show it to anyone and you may be totally embarrassed by it and it's awful. But there's that 10% that you're like, oh, I really like this. I really am onto something. And that's, you know, that's the goal. So you just have to have that discipline and that practice to do enough of the work so that you're going to have a giant pile of it so that, you know, that 10% that you like is going to be enough where you can make a song and then you can make an EP and then you can make an album and then you can have a, a set's worth of material to play in front of an audience. And, uh, that's all it is. It's just a, dis- a discipline and, and, uh, a practice. It's building the house, you know, one, that's, that's mm-hmm. a beautiful way to put it. Um, you gave a really interesting quote about songs years ago to the Washington post. You were, you were speaking about one of us and you said about, uh, 
you said, we have this theory that this song is a living creature with a mind of its own that used Eric to be born and used me to spread its message. <laughs> it's a living creature and we're at its service. Is that still how you feel about songs? And also, if it is, how do you put yourself in a position to be at the service of as many good songs as possible? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I I do sometimes think that. And I think it, it came to me because of something that Van Morrison said about being the radio you know the the music is out there and all you you what your job is as the artist or the singer or the musician is to be the radio that allows yourself to be a channel for that music and um i think you know the thing that i said about uh, a discipline and a practice for songwriting that's what it is it's it's making that space and that time uh and and that clarity for yourself that you can hear the things that are coming in because you're, you know, stuff is coming into you all the time. And, you know, this might sound a little bit new agey, but who knows where all that stuff comes from, where the ideas come from, where, you know, it could just be that your senses are picking up the information around you and, and, uh, you know, creating something within your mind, or it could be coming from someplace else entirely. You know, we, we don't know that. So no matter where it comes from, you have to make yourself open enough to hear it and you have to be humble and you have to understand that you don't know everything and that you're still searching and you're still listening. And that's the, you know, I think that's how you can receive those great ideas. Yeah. I don't think you have to subscribe to any particular religious practice to, to just simply note that where songs and, and the initial a uh, kind of kernel for them or any creative work obviously comes from some otherworldly place. It, it obviously comes mm -hmm. from a place, the best of it, that um, the writers themselves it, it can almost take no credit for in some way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you always hear those stories about, you know, uh, who was like Elton John, you know, wrote like three classic songs, like Tiny Dance and two other songs like in an afternoon you know oh, like gosh. of course he's brilliant and he's hugely talented and he's out and john but you know all of that in one afternoon i mean come on <laughs> you know that's a real gift and and who knows where it came from um it maybe it just came from the years that he had spent doing all the work in music that he had done and it was just that day that you know the payoff came or maybe it came from somewhere else who knows but thank goodness it did come yeah. And yeah. he was ready to receive it. He was ready to receive it. That's just it. He was, he was ready. And, and, uh, and I'm sure, well, all writers after that think to themselves like, okay, well, how do I, how do I just receive that again? Can I just do that every day? Can I just channel? <laughs> <laughs> um, mm. Now, when you, uh, I'll end here. When you released um, one of us, the, the cultural milieu in the United States nationally was was a bit different than it is now. It was a bit more conservative. Mm -hmm. it, in some ways, um, it seems like at the time that song uh, would have been controversial to, to some people, particularly uh, religious people. Now, you're putting out an album now that is a very um, – it's confronting the political moment, I would say, in a very mm -hmm. um, uh, straightforward, uh, like sort of frontal assault um, did mm -hmm. you feel that at the time that you were out of step with the cultural milieu or that it was challenging? And, and how does that feel now, uh, releasing an album that is similarly uh, provocative, I would say? You mean, did it? Did I feel like I was being provocative by uh, releasing the song, What If God Was One of Us? Yes. Um, I, I did not. Um, and, I, you know, it's, it's a song that Eric Bazilian wrote, um, so I can't take credit for bringing it into the world. Um, but I was sort of surprised that people, you know, who were uh, conservative religious people responded to it in this negative way, because I, I feel like the song, you know, this, this sort of question of, you know, what if God was one of us and if, you know, if he were a stranger on the bus and all of that, it, it really sort of refers in my mind to, you know, the biblical story of the good Samaritan and, and, uh, you know, the, the, the quote, uh, you know, I, I don't know the exact quote, but, you know, Jesus said something like, as you treat the lowest of people on this earth, that is the way that you're treating me. You did it to me. So, yeah. And, yeah. It's so it, so it sounds to me, that's what that song, you know, brings to mind. It's, you know, how can we look at each other and realize that there is God in all of us? Now, you know, certain, you know, conservative Christian people 
thought that that was really blasphemous and they didn't like it and they picketed my concerts and I got death threats and, you know, it was, it was kind of intense there for a while. Um, but it, no, I, I did not expect that. Um, as far as the, the new record, uh, Trouble and Strife, um, you know, that's really, it, it the songs are more overtly political and I, you know, I have that intent to express, you know, my thoughts and my views uh, about uh, what's going on in the world today. You know, there's so much corruption and there's so much abuse of power. And, uh, you know, as a, as a person, as a citizen, that makes me furious. And as an artist, I feel like it's um, part of my job is to, uh, you know, make music that has something to do with what's going on in the world. Now, you know, maybe somebody else doesn't want to do that. Some other artists might decide that they don't want to engage with politics and that's fine. Um, but for me, I just felt like I have this platform and I wanted to say something about what's going on. Um, and also to say it in a way that allows music to do what it does best, uh, which is to lift people up. You know, I'm not interested in lecturing people. Uh, I wanted to write songs that had a point of view, but that also were joyous and were energizing. And I think that's one of the things that we need from music right now is to allow us to stay connected to a sense of joy and a sense of energy because we really need that right now. We need a place to go in our minds to rejuvenate us and music has such power to do that. So, so those were really sort of my two, um, you know, the, the things that I intended with this, this record is to, to put my voice into the, you know, into, uh, let's see, how can I say this better to express what I'm feeling about the current moment and to call out people who are abusing their power, but also to, to be joyful and to be energetic and to let the music be uplifting. To be the happy warrior. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> and also again, if, if to use this uh, analogy that you used earlier, if you're the, if you're just the radio bringing in the signal, then, you know, don't, don't blame the, the radio for the, uh, the, the signal that's coming in on you know, number 980 or whatever. <laughs> um, well, uh, thank you so much for being a part of the Working Songwriter podcast. I admire you deeply, and I, I'm just so touched that you would take the time. Thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you so much. This has been a real pleasure. This month's show was brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. Use promo code TWS, the initials of our podcast, TWS, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Joan Osborne's latest album is entitled Trouble and Strife, available everywhere music is sold or streamed. If before we meet again, you sit down to write, please remember, an expensive drug habit is not a song, a compelling Instagram account is not a song, and most importantly, reverb is not a song. So let all that take care of itself, and for you, just keep your eye on the song. <laughs>